Hey guys, it's Scott Lips, and welcome to another episode of Spin Magazine's Lip Service. I'm with one of my favorite rock bands today, Failure. Hey guys, how are you? Hello. Good. Introducing Hi. all you guys, Kelly, we got Ken, we have Greg. Uh, thanks for coming in, guys. Great to see you in person. And we found out that actually we have a mutual friend, Sean Daly, which uh, yep. shout out to Sean Daly. Sean played with me at Courtney Love's Ooh. band and still is a great friend to stay. And actually, what I didn't know about, he was actually working on a documentary for you guys, which is, uh, could you talk a little bit about that? I want to get into the new record and tons of stuff going on with mm -hmm. you, but, but it is something that I just found out about, which is pretty interesting. So, Sean and one of uh, his partners, Don Hardy, uh, another filmmaker in the Bay Area, started filming it what like two years ago I or even longer, longer. like four yeah two, three four years ago and um they got pretty far down the line and then you know the pandemic hit and it became like you know uh, like so some projects are uh you know kind of like uh pet projects you know that you do on the side yeah f you know thinking about the you know, kind of long-term thing of it, and they just couldn't do that anymore. They had to take jobs that were actually paying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so... It would be an amazing documentary, by the way, Ken, because your story is such a fascinating one. I mean, the band was together for years, broke up for 17 years, I believe, and got back together for the last three records now. So I, for one, would love to watch this documentary because I think it'd be an amazing, it's, it's an amazing story. Um, and I, and I want to get into your whole history, but take me back to the beginning when you guys started. I think it was like, what was it, about 1990 that the band formed? Uh, 89, 89, we formed. I think we had our our first le like uh, rehearsal together uh, in mid-89. Um, played about 20 shows in Hollywood, like at Al's Bar and, and, and you know, sort of small smaller clubs. Uh, cl club lingerie mm -hmm. uh, which was a really cool it's rock Sandy club back in the early 90s yeah. that's where i met maynard actually he w he saw us playing there and came up to me one after a show and was like hey i'm in this band called tool and uh we don't really like the bands that the local promoters are putting us with we want we want to play with you guys and like a, maybe two or three months later we were playing at Raji's together Amazing. Yeah, he was on the show, I think, a month ago, and we, we talked a little bit about that scene from back then. Because there was two scenes, right? There was, like, the Raji scene, and I don't know if you remember Scream with Dale Gloria, mm -hmm. yep. and all those clubs. And then there was, like, the other scene, which was obviously Gazzari's and the Whiskey, and, and you guys obviously fit into the, you know, it was more of um, I was like, I know there was Raji's, and there was, we were talking about Al's Bar, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jabber Scream, Jaw. Jabberjaw, right? Gaslight. Gaslight. Gaslight, right. And there was, so it was obviously, like, a, there was sort of the James Addiction scene, which you guys are more a part of. And then the other scene, which was sort of like the hair band scene that was slowly dying out at that point. Yeah. About Just starting to die out. Just starting to die out, yeah. yeah. But did you guys grow up together? C take me back, if you don't mind, because, Ken, I know you've had an incredible career as a producer and mixer, too. But I don't, I don't, let's talk about like how you guys met and your story, because it, it is a really fascinating one. Well, I mean, the very beginning, maybe not that, that fascinating. <laughs> I had a friend who was a drummer, and he was my roommate. Robert Goss, and he was the uh, first drummer for Failure. He did the first album. But he and I sort of had the idea of doing a band or trying to do a band uh, for two years. I think we talked about it in 87, as early as 87. Uh, we were both in college at the time here in LA, and we put ads in The Recycler and in Music Connection magazine back when yeah. that was a thing right that was yeah and that was the yeah. thing and i saw those ads <laughs> for a, a year or two i was working with someone else but i was still kind of keeping track of stuff and there weren't a lot of good ads out there yeah. looking for interesting stuff um but that one always stuck out to me because it, it said um moody trio seeks fretless bass player parallels with early cure bauhaus and joy division fretless and bass player yeah actually. Well, <laughs> fretless. Like well the funny thing it's is so specific the, the right? funny it's thing like was at first <laughs> it said fretless right. and then you guys dropped the fretless because you probably no one played in that atmosphere at that yeah. point which the hair metal was still right. 
big in that atmosphere i you know fretless was just another obstacle yeah well it was around <laughs> the time when guns was sort of really blowing up obviously but you know i guess throwing the fretless thing in the mix was just you probably may get one like resume you know it's like or yeah how many people or a were bunch playing? of like music based school all right i mean it was literally the case where robert and i fielded maybe o over those two years we fielded maybe eight or ten responses in total and mm -hmm. we were running it in both magazines every week or month or whatever it was um and none of those calls were promising enough to even get in a room with anyone yeah yeah it was by far i mean it, it was the coolest uh looking for ad that that i'd come across but i was kind of committed to this this person i was working with and as soon as that uh, as soon as that was broken off um that was the first call we made. And did you get a fretless space? I guess that's the most important uh, question. Yeah, <laughs> well, I did. I <laughs> did. I did because <laughs> some of the the earliest demos were done on fretless, and and uh, and I loved the idea of fretless. So I was happy about that. It's amazing that bands like Guns N' Roses found each other through the recycler back then, because if you think about like where we are today and how this really, you know, it's like reading an ad. It seems so foreign, right? That concept of act. So it's amazing that you guys actually found each other. And where it went, and so, but you can you didn't really start playing guitar, I don't believe, till you were eighteen, right? You were sort of a late bloomer in music. Yeah, yep. I had, I think I had three piano lessons when I was nine years old, and they went nowhere. I hated it, and never really considered playing an instrument or anything musical really until my senior year in high school. Wow. And I, my brother was a really good guitar player my younger brother and i just said hey i, I want to play show me some chords and he was like why have you why are you just saying this now i've been playing for four years <laughs> He's, and i'm just i don't know just show me some chords <laughs> and uh then i spent maybe that year or so um learning like maybe a couple records like the car's first record Great record. And playing along with that. That was a really good record to yeah. learn guitar on. Yeah. Simple, simple right? Yeah. Simple, simple. Yeah. easy to pick out the, the chords and the bar chords and stuff. And um, and to learn about ra arrangement, though, yeah. because that record is really like a good record to study if Incredible you want to just know yeah. about uh, pop arrangement and production. So. Uh, and then it didn't take too long before I got really interested, probably too early, in multi-track recording. Mm. <laughs> I mean, back then it was four-track cassette. Yeah. Uh, but it just had the panning on it and nothing else. It was like, right? yeah, was, panning, no, yeah. no EQ. Yeah. You had four tracks, panning and volume, and you know, it's just one of those things where, like, I think a lot of guitar players were going, were 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 getting to be better guitar players mm. and i you know was going down this path of like i, I want to overdub on myself <laughs> you know like right yeah. now like i can barely put like four chords together but i already want to lay down those four chords and then put a, either a bass part or a, or something on it like that part of it was so that had the pull to me mm. rather than becoming a really great guitarist and some of those early influences for you guys, the Cure and Bauhaus, the, the darker side of music. So is it, that, is it that what connected you guys? Or was it the darker side of music that brought you together, would you say? Because obviously we're coming out of the hair metal scene and that kind of music was in chic a little bit, but you know, so many different scenes were sort of melody at that point. So is that what you think brought you together, the love of the, the darkness side of music? I, I think the, the mood of that stuff yeah. was what brought us together. But we also loved... I mean, the Pixies were a band that that we really loved. That was happening at that moment, and sure, and uh, and and we loved uh, the classics: Beatles, Pink Floyd, um, Elton John, El mm -hmm. Elton John, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, it, it was pretty much everything. But I think what we we did really respond to bands that had like a a, a unique, strong. Uh, atmospheric emotional mood that when you heard it you just knew Resonated. who that was yeah do you remember the first songs you guys wrote together well <sighs> probably um pro 
probably macaque must have been pretty early. Yeah. Uh, and um, I don't know. There's a song called Comfort. Screen Man. There was a song called Comfort. Yeah, there Do you was remember a song that was that, w- that was an early idea. Screen yeah. Man was was pretty early. Screen Man was one of the ones one of the first songs that I think we did. No. That came from a jam. Yeah, but no, I know what it, I mean. Count my eyes. Okay. I think count my eyes may have been the first. That was at Bluebird. Right. That was the first. Place, and uh, yeah, and that was kind of the first song where we just started playing uh, with with Robert the drummer and playing each one playing our weird part and <laughs> just interlocking in a strange way and calling it a song. And initially you started <laughs> playing these gigs at where, I guess, like you said, at Al's Bar and places like that. And it was just friends. Mm-hmm. And then I heard a story you were telling, Ken, how eventually we started seeing a lot more people show up that weren't our friends. Mm-hmm. So we had an idea that obviously something was clicking with the audience. So take me back to that time period for you and just how you knew things were starting to gel and come together for the band. Pre-Kelly, obviously. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, it, for me, it was a bit of confusion. I wasn't sure if the people were there for us or the next band. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you never do know. Do you, you never know? really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But what you sort of know is w- when you finish playing, if everyone goes out <laughs> right, to the patio. Right. right, right? right. Everyone leaves, right. <laughs> well, it's safer to yeah. assume that, too, so you're not yeah. let down. Right. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, there were there were a couple shows where I was like, what's going on? Like, this is more people. This is definitely more people yeah. than we're used to. And sure enough, like it wasn't too long after that that show where there were like, you know, record label people in the crowd and stuff and coming up to us and giving us their cards and stuff. And all of a sudden you meet uh, did you meet Steve Albini around 92? Was that about the time you guys met? I mean, we didn't meet in person cuz he was he was in Chicago, we were in LA, but his name came up as potential producers after we had signed with slash and they we had our demo of, of some of some form of a demo at that point and slash sent it to him and i remember i think it was randy k our our a and r person who brought us to slash um he said hey steve's into it you should he he wants to talk to you and i forget i was at a friend's house but i i remember taking that <laughs> call <laughs> And him just being like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's cool, man. It's, it's like, could be huge. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, like, <laughs> could be the next big thing. I don't know, man. Let's, <laughs> let's just record it, see what happens. <laughs> Obviously, one of the greatest rock producers uh, ever. And so were you, were you super into his work at that point? Were you very familiar with his work? Super familiar with yeah. his work. Very familiar with his work. <laughs> and then we had a second phone call, like, I don't know, how how much further down the line it was uh maybe just a few days but where where we kind of reviewed or he asked me like what is your favorite stuff of mine Mm. just so i know where your head is coming from and i was like two things real specific things the jesus lizard goat album yeah and um breeders pod album Mm. And he's just he just snickered. He's like, yeah, those are my two best records. <laughs> he was yeah. just like, boom, that's it. End of conversation. And I, I, I just felt we were totally on the same page after he said that. So um, th- we locked it in and went to Minnesota a few weeks later. Uh, so obviously, 92, recording with Steve Albini and touring with Tool eventually, seems like you guys were definitely on the right path early on. I mean, this is pre-Kelly, right? So... Talk to me about when you guys met Kelly and how he came into the picture, because the sound would change. The sound changed when Kelly came in, but um, it was kind of because Greg had come in as more of a uh, collaborative songwriter, Mm. actually, in between Comfort and Magnified. Um, And so our sound was changing um, during that process. And actually truth be told the sound changing is what led our first drummer to kind of bail because mm. he didn't like where it was going it was going a little bit more melodic a little bit more songy yeah and i think he yeah. was just kind of like hmm. yeah uh, well ken and i that's when we started writing together in a room with a four track and mm. and living together yeah mm-hmm. that's right and and uh w- you know having our two instruments on and just discovering stuff playing through uh 
and writing songs. And one of the one of the first ones we did was Bernie, yeah. a demo of Bernie. And we, you know, Bernie had this oh, yeah. weird, yeah. cool pop thing. We we were excited about discovering this side of us, and and w- we played it for Rob and. He he was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you meet Kelly? Actually, what we we needed. So we ended up finishing the second record, essentially without a drummer. I mean, we sort sort of had someone, didn't really work out. Greg ended up playing at least half the drums on that second record. Oh. Then you know, I don't think we ever really told the label that we didn't have a drummer, because we were worried that would freak them out yeah (laughs) so (laughs) we never really told them and so the whole process of like finishing the record getting it mastered scheduled for a release date and booking tours just kept happening Mm -hmm. and so (laughs) eventually we were like uh we uh we need a drummer yeah if we're gonna play these shows and these tours and tools asking us to go on support so we needed to find someone we put some feelers out um, I actually ended up being out of town when G- Greg ended up auditioning a few people. And so I wasn't actually there when they first got together. Which is because wow. Kelly wow. flaked on the uh, original. Yeah, let's back up a second. <laughs> okay. I missed the original audition. Oh, right. And you called me extremely upset because oh, I yeah. wasted your time. That's right. And I suggested just coming out and auditioning with Greg because you wouldn't be around. Oh yeah, I, I was pissed because I I planned a trip to Europe. Yeah, mm. so I was in yeah. in Europe after the main drummer auditions were supposed to have already happened, but I had heard from several people, don't decide until you play with this guy, because he's a monster, and I was like, fuck. So I had to. So I'm in Europe. Greg plays with him, and Greg calls me. Yeah, and he's like, yeah. This is the guy. Ca- this is the guy. Called you from mates. From, from mates. From the rehearsal. rehearsal. I mean, yeah. We'd just been playing together. I called you five minutes after I think we, we stopped. Yeah, we played through each song once. Maybe two songs twice. And Kelly, were you in bands locally at that point? Or you've been playing on records? What was Well, your that was kind of part record? of the problem. Yeah. Is I was looking for them and playing in way too many bands. Yeah. So when we set up the audition, I just put the tape on a shelf and completely spaced out. I feel there's a band called Plexi. Do you remember so Plexi? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I feel like Norm, Norm was yeah. in this circle, right? Yeah. Because I remember him being like and one of the better yeah, Norm drummers Block. at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, because I feel like maybe were you guys friends? Were you yeah. friends oh, with Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. It's all coming back to me. You know, it's. Uh, and Campfire just, Girls. Right, right. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's funny. So, I, I, for me, I honestly like I one of my favorite records, I'd say the last 20 years is Fantastic Planet. So, you know, I put that record on even before this was happening. I would put that record on periodically every few years and just say, what a fucking amazing record. Mm. So, you know, for those of you who don't have that record, go out, buy the record, download the record and the new record and all the other records. But one of the greatest records. So when you came into the band for me, it took on a whole new meaning and a whole new life. And and, uh, and I, I, we were talking about it kind of before we started rolling here. Your parts uh, were incredible and are incredible. And so um, rhythmically, what were you listening to? Because I feel like there was almost like a Nine Inch Nails element to sort of the the rhythms that happen within the band and just uh, just this very hev- heavy rhythmic sense that I didn't hear on the first record that it took on a different kind of tone. Well, I mean, that record in particular was my failure boot camp. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of what I came into the band with they helped me remove mm. um, uh, most of it. I mean, it was 80s right, stuff. Right, right, right. You had a certain musical sensibility, and sure. it just wasn't useful for what they were doing. Um, so that, I mean, was my moment. Like, that's when I joined the band. Yeah. And hours and hours and days and days, like, they molded me into and, and offered me a completely different musical language. And all the while this is happening, Slash is going through its own set of problems, the record label, right? So you're getting ready to make Fantastic Planet. And there were, there were some issues with the label, right? They were being sold or something at that point? No, it was after we had actually completed the record, or just as we were completing it, our manager at the time, Warren Entner, you probably yeah, sure. know Warren. Yeah, sure. Faster um, Pussycat or whoever. He, sure. Rage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quite right. Yeah, yeah. Quite Quite right. Heavy metal band and <laughs> he, in the Hall of Fame. He's, yeah. th- he's a perfect example of that transition. Right, sure. Like, look at his yeah, roster. Yeah in the mid 80s yeah. 
And then in the early 90s. To Rage, he, Faith No More. Yeah. Like yeah. Us and yeah. L7, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, he called me. I think we were talking about a mastering day or, or evaluating the mastering. And he was like, dude, I got some bad news. You, you're turning in an album to a label that doesn't exist. Um, so we have no idea what's going to happen, what they're going to do with your contract. They're trying to sell the whole label with all the artists intact. And, you know, they're being uh, vague about the whole thing. So, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, you, and you must have known you had something special with that record because that record in particular was probably your culmination of all these years of songwriting was like you, you must have known you were onto something Really well, I don't record. know. I mean, we were so insecure about our, um, you know, the size of the band or mm. the popularity of the band at that point. You know, the re previous record had done like 40,000 or something. So it was, which, which now would be amazing, right. but like <laughs> back then was like, uh, yeah, next album, please. Yeah. Um, so, but I did know this, we put everything into Fantastic Planet. Yeah. I mean, ev ev everything we had as artists and, and, and sort of creativity, uh, we had put into that record. And to know that there was a possibility it may never come out was, yeah, that, mm -hmm. was, that was a dark time. Yeah. And would it be safe to say, Ken, that you didn't love the touring process or don't love it as much as the recording process itself? And as a band, do you love being on the road or do you guys prefer being in the studio? I mean, overall, I would pick the studio over touring because you're getting to be creative more of the time, mm -hmm. you know. But having said that, I mean, and just kind of going back in the history of the band a little bit, like when Kelly, Kelly joined the band on the touring for the second record. Yeah. And so that was a r really important moment. I mean, Fantastic Planet obviously w w go on to be an important thing, but that was really the moment where I felt like our live shows became like a band. Yeah. Like we rocked out together. Yeah. Um, and so when we went in to do Fantastic Planet, we had that kind of like mojo between us yeah. where we knew how to like, yeah, let's do it. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, and that just kind of kept going, you know, and it has expanded. And now, you know, we can go, we could have an idea uh, like, hey, why don't we just improvise jam for a month, record it all, don't r write any songs or arrange, just jam together, just let our brains go crazy and see where that takes us in the album making process. And uh the result is this new record yeah yeah and i want to get into the new record but 17 years between all these sets of records right the three records before and the three records now so what was it that sort of brought the band back together i mean i heard in some interviews that it was really kids between greg and and you can that you kind of bonded on having a family right what, was that sort of part of the impetus of getting back together just calling your buddy and saying hey you know Let's talk about our kids. By the way, maybe we should consider getting back together. Well, we d when we broke up in 97, it wasn't pretty. And so, like, the distance between Greg and I from then to even 10 years later was still pretty significant. Mm. Like, we didn't hang out too much. We heard about each other's movements or whatever <laughs> yeah. through others. And it was yeah. this... We were estranged, yeah. for sure. Yeah, we didn't hang out at all. No. Yeah. I mean... Uh, we didn't talk at all. There, mm -hmm. there was for I, I don't know how long it was. I think there was like a twelve or fifteen year period where maybe I we talked once or. Well, we did the when we did the golden thing. That was like maybe ten years. I think that was like two thousand seven, two thousand eight. So we kind of hung out to do that. It was just kind of like not as not intending to reignite the band at all more like looking at it like the band has been done for a long time here's some archival stuff that people might like yeah but that was the sort of big we made contact at least through that mm. and then a few years after that we had kids we we have we both had our first uh, kids within uh, like five or six months of each other and th that is that's where we 
did start hanging out a lot because we put the two kids together, right? right? You almost just need a buddy to call and say, hey, how do I change the diapers over here? What's going on? Well, just the stress of being a new parent, you're looking for someone to talk to about that stuff and just... Yeah. And I mean, it was was pretty innocent that we were just hanging out like that, but um, you just, you couldn't avoid that hanging in the air was this, you know... Looming. Yeah, why do you think you took a break for so long? Obviously, you did your solo record. You did, I mean, you had various projects on, and uh, you're the rabbit, I believe, right? But why Why do you think it was so long? Before, did you just have to pursue other things that creatively that you think it just sort of, you know, musically it was another direction that you all wanted to take? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just... It I mean, for, for me, there was never... I, I wasn't thinking that we would... Uh, you know, we did the, the golden thing, and... But I wasn't thinking we would ever work together again. Really, and um, you know, because I had another band, I had Auto Lux, yeah. and uh, and I thought maybe we'd maybe we'd work together in a different way. Maybe we'd like score soundtracks or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. I could imagine, but the idea of failure, uh, reforming, and 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 being a band again and making records was that that was the furthest thing from my mind but in a way when the so the internet probably brought back a lot of renewed interest in the band because again the records are so great and before you had the internet and whatever it was right 97 2000 i mean people weren't really there wasn't maybe a way to discover music as much as there is now and then people found this newfound interest in failure and realized how great those records were so that's probably one of the reasons i would imagine that there was some renewed interest in the band, right? Yeah, because we were hanging out, and I think some of the people around us were noticing that. And then they started telling us things like, you know, if you guys have got back together, your 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 audience is bigger than it was in the 90s. Yeah. And we were like, huh, how do you know that? And yeah. they didn't, you, you couldn't prove it, yeah. right? <laughs> you didn't have streaming services. There, you know, yeah. Check the numbers, yeah. Right, so yeah. it was like, well, maybe, okay. And so it was like, but that that sort of, idea kept coming up like you have an audience there and if if you wanted to make new music for them i think they would be receptive so Mm. you should consider that and we just kept considering that and then we kind of started experimenting in my studio a little bit Mm -hmm. and writing together and that was to me that once we had those two songs um that ultimately ended up on the heart is a monster the first album back um I felt really strong about those songs and I felt st- strong about our ability to still come up with music that sounded vital to me. Mm. And, and it, it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't just a, a retread. It wasn't trying to recapture former glory or whatever. Yeah, that was an inspiration. Um, it w- yeah, it sounded it sounded like new and it sounded like it could open a door and we could actually um, you know, do do interesting new relevant stuff. Um, and that, that was, uh, for me, that was what r- really inspired me to, to consider that. Definitely. And then we did our first show back. At the El Rey, uh, right? At the El Rey, yeah. which was kind of, um, you know, like Ken was just saying, we ha- really had no idea. We'd heard, heard some things about that there was a fan base and th- there was demand, but, um, until we did that show and it sold out and like, 30, 30, whatever. I, like I heard 30 minutes. seconds or yeah. three minutes or whatever. <laughs> but it was Some <laughs> multiple of three. <laughs> and uh, Whatever and it is, there was a fan base it, there for sure. It, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. it, was, it, it kind of shocked us. Yeah. And, then, um, and then at the actual show, we realized that uh, a large percentage of the audience had traveled great distances to be there, like yeah. c- across the planet um, and, and across the U.S. And... Um, and the that, that kind of changed. Th- then we realized, like all of these yeah. rumors we had heard about the the cult following growing over the years, is true. Tr- actually yeah. true. Well, the, and the uh, the other specific thing I think we noticed at that show was that there was a large uh, a percentage of younger people mm. at the show who who clearly didn't know about the band in the nineties because yeah. they probably weren't <laughs> born or were yeah. toddlers. Yeah. So that was. That because you know, y- you want to be you know vital, right? Yeah, you want to be 
not just appealing to the people that heard you 20 years ago, but you want to open up some new ears as well. So mm-hmm. when I saw that and I actually spoke to some of them after the show, like spoke to a spoke to a kid who was like 18 and he was there with his whole band of 18 year olds and talking about how he, he, he said, you, you broke up in 97 on the day I was born. <laughs> <laughs> we expected more receding hairlines at that show. <laughs> yeah. well, that's incredible. And Kelly, it's, it's uh, interesting. We were talking about this again before we started recording, but you were keeping busy too, right? You were doing stuff with Linda Perry. And, I'm trying and, to. Yeah, and, and what I didn't know is that we have this crazy connection that, of, of course, I've been playing drums with Courtney Love for like 10 years, and you played on yeah. some of those early yeah, some of the recordings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Letter to God, I believe you yeah. played on, right? Yeah, it's a great. Hit. Yeah, so so that's cool. So you were just staying busy. You you had a bunch of I, you studio know, I was stuff just you were doing, scrambling and, and saying yes, and yeah, trying yeah. to stay busy. I mean, I wasn't really useful at anything else. So, yeah. Um, you know, after the band broke up, I tried as best possible to remain playing music. Yeah, because Ken, you went on to have this incredible career as a producer and mixer, and work with incredible artists like Paramore. You worked on the Chris Cornell track for um, the James Bond movie and Beck, great, great artist. So again, like you found this whole nother life in production and mixing and going back to failure and, and starting this again, was it a little bit daunting knowing you had a very sex, uh, successful career as a, a mixer and producer too? Was it was it like, hey, do I want to start up the, the band thing again after being very well known in, in this production space? Yeah, I had like, um, it was sort of like this uh, pattern where I would uh, try to do a a new artist project. Maybe the on thing was more of a solo album, and then I did another band, Year of the Rabbit. But uh, both of those ended in kind of like record label hell, basically. Right. And I kind of both times I swore off trying to be an artist again. Mm. You know, yeah. I was just like, why am I bothering doing this? I like to be in the studio people are paying me to be in the studio right now it's not my own music but it's still kind of that creative environment so yeah forget this artist stuff i'll let the other people handle it (laughs) that are maybe better at it i don't know yeah but the the failure thing when that possibility came back that was a different thing because there was already a real history there and Mm. a real um there was a fan base already there, yeah. kind of ready to absorb it. And because of that, because of that fact that there was already a fan base, we were able to avoid the label industry situation mm. and and do it all ourselves, essentially. I mean, you, or you g- I was going to say, you did use Pledge Music for a while there, right? Before that went mm. kaput, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've used services like Pledge. We, we even... On the on the first record back, the heart is a monster. We licensed the record to a physical distributor who put the record in stores, mm. but we still owned the masters. Yeah. We d- we weren't beholden to a record label. Sure. And importantly, we didn't need tour support. Yeah, yeah. So, very different situation um, to walk into as an artist. It's a, it's like walking into a band that's already kind of like at a certain level. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was much easier and much more enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. So much more enjoyable to just have it yourself, do it yourself and do it with your friends. Yeah. But talk about that for a moment, like doing it yourself now versus being on a label like slash Warner brothers for years. Right. Talk about the process and, and, and what that means to a band like Failure. Because, again, such a great record. The new record already, I think, was charting on the, t- on the alternative rock charts, like top ten, I believe, right? Mm. Which is amazing, right, for yeah. a DIY record and something you put out yourselves. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not and, even and it must make you Yeah, it must make you pretty proud, right? Because it's a great record, by the way. And also to have it charting, doing it yourself is pretty interesting, right? So talk about you know how a band like yourselves deals with the business side of that versus being on a major and what that means i mean i was talking to we were just talking about kelly like you you're self-managed now i believe right yeah and so yeah. That, and talk about that you know the, the business of music now where it's all gone for you as a band well i think there's a, uh, a kind of a misnomer out there that once you're signed by a record label your artist career is um 
kind of taken care of. Right. Right. It's just a loan. That's <laughs> yeah. all it is. You it's know, a bank. It's a loan. But you, the reality is you actually have to the, – the real work actually starts when you get signed because now you don't just have to promote your product, your music or whatever – to the public and music listeners and or music buyers, whatever you want to call them, you you have to promote yourself to your own label exactly. for yeah. attention. Yeah, because they've got a roster, and they are prioritizing that roster every minute of every day. It, you're 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 either you know second, third, fourth, yeah. fifth it, it, yeah. in the money, right? In in how much money they're spending. So you find yourself trapped in these situations where the politics, the internal politics of the label and what's going on there with those personalities and their other acts are having huge Im as, are having huge impact on mm. on your what we're trying to do. So if you I mean when we we avoided that it's like only the people who are really invested in the band doing well are now working for us. Yeah. Because if you're on a label, y they are sort of interested in you doing well, but not at the expense of another artist doing well. Or, you know, it just depends who your person is, you yeah. know, that's there. And I, I think for a lot, of, a lot of acts, and certainly for me um, in my history with labels, is that you come in with one team signing you who are big believers and they want to help your career. They all get fired. Well, by the time your <laughs> record's done, they're all gone. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> In one of the endless cycles of regime changes, right, as right. they say. Yeah. So it's just kind of, it's just so confusing and frustrating and, and just kind of, you feel helpless, mm. really. It became the, an obstacle. Yeah. Because yeah. even back then, I think Slash probably had Faith No More, if I'm correct, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, tour comes in, Guns N' Roses, like, should we put Faith No More on it? Should we put Failure on it? How do they prioritize, right? So now your career is in your own hands, right? Mm -hmm. So you talk about like the new record, like let's talk about the new record for a moment. So touring in this world, this crazy pandemic world we're in, talk, I mean, are you guys going to go out on the road? Do you have plans? Are there other plans to promote the record? I, I think I heard you talking about possibly a pay-per-view thing, right? Possibly a pay-per-view thing. We're mulling that over, and we are going to announce a real tour, North American tour, in, in the next month or so. Great. And yeah. fingers crossed, we actually get to play it this time. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, we had some several shows canceled mm. in the summer of 2020 from the pandemic. Yeah, is is it daunting for you to think about going out now on the road? Are you are you at peace with like what's going on? Just figured it is what it is. You know, we've gotten vaccinated, boosted, whatever it may be, and it's going to be what it is. Like we just have to get out there and live lives. Or how do you feel about touring in this era? What's going on? So many tours are canceled and rebooked. And well, I'm I for me, I'm specifically worried about getting ill. Period. Right. right. Because the last tour that we did in 2019, b before COVID, mm. I ended up with pneumonia at the wow. end. Wow. Yeah. And I, I had to f cancel one of the shows on that tour for because I couldn't even walk basically. Yeah. Wow. So I had it too for like a week. <sighs> I, I don't know. You know, we, we're not playing massive places, so the audience is kind of right close. Sure. And I'm singing like a lot right. in a failure set. So sure. my mouth is open and I'm my my whole you know throat is kind of exposed and raw. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's you're, you're ripe for getting yeah, yeah. a cold or yeah. a flu. Yeah. And God forbid, not COVID, you yeah. know, but we'll be, we'll be all vaxxed up. That's yeah. for sure. It's a little scary. Yeah. And but you I worry about the fans too. It's like putting, you know, a few hundred people in close proximity mm. and, you know, God forbid, I don't want anyone to get hurt yeah. at one of our shows. Definitely. I, I totally agree. So this new record, y obviously there's no upcoming shows yet, but uh, just alternative ways to promote the record like this that we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but the pay-per-view thing sounds great. I think that'd be great. I think a lot of people would tune into that. So I'm all for you guys doing that if you decide to do that. Okay. I'll definitely be there virtually. Okay. For sure. Um, what are your thoughts about where we're going, like, just for the future? I, I feel like, Ken, you're really into sort of where technology is going. You always had, you were always really into gear, and you are very into gear and sort of the tech side of things. So do you feel like uh, 
Thalia will be performing in the metaverse anytime soon. Is that someplace <laughs> you see people buying land there now? I'm, I'm so out of the loop with what's going on in life. You're right. Yeah. Do there need to be not virtual until concerts they, in the not metaverse? Not until the metaverse starts having like legs. Right, right. But I feel like that could be the next thing, right? Bands performing in the metaverse could be like a new thing. I don't even know what the metaverse is. <laughs> yes. I'm so sorry. It's the uh, new where you only exist in virtually. In virtually. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. fascinating. I mean, you do people your meetings, are, you do your shopping, you live yeah. your life from your couch in a virtual world. Yeah, like people, so you're an avatar. Yeah. Yeah, and people are With buying like uh, they haven't figured out how to do the leg thing yet. Yeah, uh, that's just because uh, I mean that exists because we're all in denial of the fact that we're already in the metaverse. Right. Yeah. We might be in it already. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw someone bought like a, a million dollar plot of land next to Snoop Dogg's virtual house in the metaverse like this week. So I was just thinking, again, I'm sure concerts are the next things that are going to take place in the future here in, in this virtual world. But um, what are other ways that you're doing to promote for, for a band that's doing it yourself, right, to promote a record like this? Because it is such a great record. And again, just talking about the fact that it's charting already, it had to char you must have a great fan base for it to chart already if you're doing it yourself. So like what are other things that you guys will do to promote this record? Because I, I want to talk about the process of the record, too. It's such a great record. Um, I don't know. I mean, we're not doing anything really th that different. We're doing social media. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing things like this. We we are getting more requests for interviews, for, for sure, yeah. Yeah. compared to the last record. It seems like press is liking this record a little bit more. The record's definitely doing the heavy lifting this time out. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah. I definitely feel that like we can just kind of like do the normal stuff, book the tour, and you know, kind of let the music speak for itself. Now, know. how important are videos for you these days? Because you actually directed oh. music videos years ago, and uh, mm -hmm. again, doing this deep dive, finding all these things about you that I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that you directed a few videos that ended up on MTV that were in that. What was it called again? It was the. Uh, but not the videos of the week, the 120 minutes. No, no. no. Um, he's talking about um, the the battle of it was like a battle of the bands. What was it? Yeah, called? You, you had your the, some of the early videos you directed were in this, you know, no, there subterranean was one, one band that I local band in L.A. Before I think failure was starting to form, but I was going out to shows and just enjoying local bands. And one that I found that I just loved it and kept seeing all their shows was this band called Block, mm. B-L-O-C, female singer. Nels Klein was one of the two guitarists. He was kind of a really interesting musician um, now, uh, still. Um, Remember but they did that cover of Baby, You're a Rich Man? Yeah. And he did that crazy uh, guitar part that I don't even know what instrument that is on the Beatles record, but he mimicked it mm -hmm. with a pedal. Yeah. 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 So I just appro I was in film school and I had to turn in a project mm. like a, an actual completed thing. It could be a scene like from a, a narrative scene. It could be a documentary or it could be a music video. And of course, I was. I picked music video because I love music. <laughs> so and, it, and it was the era of MTV back then. It was, and it was. Yeah. And they had this thing called MTV. Um, uh, not, what, what? Was it like I, basement tapes? Yeah, something? basement tapes. Basement tapes, tapes right. Okay. That's basement what it was. Tapes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So an unsigned band could make a video, send it into MTV, and they did it once a month, basically. The MTV editorial would pick four of those videos play them during the, this half hour show called basement tapes and while the video was playing there was a 1900 number you, underneath and you could call, call and uh, vote. vote and uh the video i did for block one amazing and and that that in a weird roundabout way kind of launched my career as a video director but strangely my first 10 major label videos after that video were all hip-hop videos mm. so that <laughs> that was before uh in the same gang and yeah and uh salt, salt ice and pepper would you yeah i did salt and pepper videos yeah yeah interesting i did i did like 10 videos for ice tea like a whole record right? <laughs> yeah i did it, yeah. i did a whole just just me and him just a camera <laughs> and him he's like i'm just gonna sit here and hold this flashlight make a video <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he, he, you had a budget of like a thousand dollars for 20 videos 
I think it was a thousand dollars for each video. Right. But yeah, and, well, he was he was a big metal guy there too. Yeah, body count. He, yeah. he had he body likes, count. Yeah, so yeah. he was really into that too. Uh -huh. um, but are there plans to make more videos for this record? Yeah, I just don't know if we have a. I don't, I don't have an idea yet for one. I mean, okay. we did one for Headstand with yeah. the uh, the insect video. <laughs> that's well, Kelly Iggy. still has that's that. Iggy yeah. is uh, the praying mantis. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That's his pet. Yeah. Ah, awesome. Yeah. Oh, I for one would I would imagine one of the next singles would be Submarines. I don't know if you guys feel like that. Would it's it's one That's of the obvious choices for me on the, the record to be the next single. Yeah, sure. We uh, and we did, did a lyric video for it. Okay. Because one thing about being like self managed um, and not having a li label is that. Sometimes we're not uh, very thorough about our schedule. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you showed up here, well, so that's what matters. A, right? so a like, video yeah. is, you know, they don't make themselves. <laughs> yeah. like, it, it usually requires like a budget, Capital. Sure, and sure. especially we have all these other things that we have to do. Yeah, so it's like you know. Well, I no, just I remember calling up Monica, who's our publicist, yeah. and saying, "Hey, we just finished uh, this new record, and." Um, it's coming out in three weeks. Can you help us with some press? <laughs> <laughs> well, because the, the record just dropped December 3rd, right? So right. If you Which is another it. good thing about not having a label. We yeah. get to put out a record at Christmas. Yeah. So yeah, they won't. Yeah, literally. Yeah. If, you're, if you're not a platinum act already, you Everyone, can't. Don't even, release a record They on won't let you re <laughs> no. release your record. Uh, next in, year. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, it worked in your favor because it already charted. So obviously it worked in your favor. <sighs> There's so many little, like... Um, kind of ideas about when d it, you should do things or how you should do things yeah. in the music business that have no relevance at all yeah. anymore. Do you still keep in touch with Maynard? Are you guys still friendly? Um, like I said, he was on the show about a month ago. So, um, Greg is more in with Maynard because he's in Pucifer right oh, now. Oh, that's right. Oh, cool. So, yeah. so yeah. Maynard was on the show talking about Pucifer and the record you guys did together. Yeah, the um, Existential Reckoning. And, yeah. and then I've done for um, kind of pay-per-view events with them. Right. Yeah, the titles and all those things were so dumb. I couldn't even really, I was like, I'm going to try and memorize these things, but I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. attempt to do this. Mm -hmm. I was like, but uh, it would be great to see you tour with those guys. It'd be, you know, I think they're going out next year. So obviously there's a history and a connection with those. So um, another great band for sure. Well, it's exciting. I love the new record. Definitely, if you guys do not have a copy of it, pick it up. Um, pick up anything failure related. You know, as I mentioned before, Fantastic Final, also one of my favorite records of all time. So um, I always talk about this other band, Jellyfish. That's mm. one of my favorite bands yeah. of all time. Roger. Too. So, yeah, Standing Roger. And drummer. Just, yeah, just amazing. I just did so, a session with Roger. Oh, you did? Yeah. Amazing, yeah. So I, I love uh, you guys have these records that have been stuck in my memory for years and huge fans. So, um, and if, if there is a pay per view special, make sure you tune in for sure. Uh, I love what you guys are doing, and, and again, I love the Sean Daly connection, and I'm sorry yeah. that I didn't remember that <laughs> initially, but uh, anything else we should promote, because this is, uh, this is the time and place. Were you guys fans of Spin Magazine growing up? Did you... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Great. So Spin, we, was, we Spin was a big deal in the 90s. Yeah, we sure. appeared in it in the 90s, and each, we definitely had a talk about how important we were going to be after seeing that. Yeah, it's been great <laughs> to, uh, to be part of the official Spin Magazine podcast family it's been great and and a lot of history there so i'm sure th i know it's been uh is a big fan of the band too which is great and so yeah so look out for the record for sure if you don't have it make sure you pick it up what's and, it called uh, y your record <laughs> yeah oh well, we know you're wild type droid uh <laughs> december 3rd you came just out. keep calling it the record yeah <laughs> got oh, the record. record wild type droid so make sure and submarines I, I hope is the next single uh love the record we'll definitely tune into the pay-per-view if you guys do it and i'll make sure i check you guys out on tour coming up hopefully that will be sometime next year uh, are there dates yet or not really it's still a little bit pending. um there's dates, dates there's okay. dates they will be announced in january okay yeah. great and will this be like a theater run you think or will it be with another band or it's going to be a headline run. Amazing. I'm looking for a scoop here, Kent, so I'm trying to yeah, get Yeah, I'm uh, not going to give you that. <laughs> 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 it'll, it'll probably be just us, an evening with. Yeah, awesome. no, it's it's going to be a full, full like, North American headline run. Amazing. Well, hopefully there'll be a date like the El Rey where I can come hang with you guys in person. This is always better to do this in person. I know initially I was doing a lot of Zooms during the pandemic, but yeah. it's always better like sit with people and connect. I, you can only connect with people so much over Zoom. It's just yeah. a weird thing. Yeah. Um, but thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate it. And uh, check out the new record once again. And there you go. Failure. Thanks, awesome. guys.